you know, now, right now, is a great time to prune many other shrubs in your landscape. And to find out the best way to do it, we've got Joe Zalezik here, our extension forester from North Dakota State University. So let's welcome Joe to the forum. It's on. Got me? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody here, uh, for that lovely welcome. Uh, good to see everybody online tonight. Actually, no, I can't see you, but uh, glad you're joining us tonight. Uh, today we're going to talk about pruning shrubs, and as I was developing this presentation, uh, I was thinking about this, how to develop it, and why do we even prune shrubs? You know, why do we do this? Same reason we prune trees. The, the goal, or the goals, are to control the size, control the shape, control the density of those shrubs. Same thing with trees. Now, the thing is, they're all related. I'm try, I was trying to put this together. You put in different techniques here, talk about size or, or shape, and all three are related. So this actually is going to bounce around a little bit, and it might not flow as well as we would hope. Uh, but I just want to give you a heads up on that. The picture here on the screen, that is the NDSU Horticulture Gardens. This is several years ago. Uh, the flowering shrubs there are Juneberries, so early spring, uh, looking beautiful. But then there's some, in the foreground, you can see there's some shrubs that are gone. What happened there? Those were dogwoods, and I cut them down to the ground, and yeah, they came right back. It wasn't a big deal. And we'll talk about that a little more. So that being said, we're actually going to start with trees. Uh, just to give a couple examples and to talk a little bit about the terminology that we're going to use. I don't get hung up on terms, but uh, sometimes when we're trying to communicate, what one person says is not what the other person hears. Any married folks out there will agree with me. Um, so let's just talk about what terms we're, we're discussing here. Yes, I am married. I don't think my wife's watching tonight. So. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, pruning trees, this is a, called a removal cut. Usually it's called a thinning cut. We're removing the branch, the smaller branch, from the bigger stem. And it's very common. This is what we usually use. It's called a, I, I call it a thinning cut. And on a, oh, there's another type of cut where we're actually cutting the bigger part. It's called a reduction cut. Okay. It's not very common. You'd see this in deciduous trees only. You won't see this in uh, conifers. At least you shouldn't. Um, it is uncommon, but it's certainly acceptable. What we try to have is that branch off to the side has to be uh, about half or half the size of the main stem or bigger. Why would we want to even do that? Why would we want, we want to reduce this tree? Um, actually, often what we're trying to do is slow it down, slow down its growth. We would do this probably on one of the branches, not so much on the leader, although I have seen this done uh, sometimes with apple trees where they're trying to create a more open form trying to actually remove a central leader, which if you're trying to create a more open form, that's, that can be done. Anyway, not very common, um, and Tom's much more of an expert on apples than I am. He's pruned a lot more apples than I am, than I, than I am, than I have, excuse me. Um, heading cuts are not recommended for trees, okay, whether they're deciduous trees or conifers, period. Heading cut is just kind of in the middle of a branch in the middle of the stem, uh, not near any connection or, or uh, conjunction. And this is not recommended for trees, period. However, with shrubs, deciduous shrubs, well, we're not so much worried about that. So let's go back to this thinning cut. And let's apply this now to shrubs. What, what happens here? OK, oh, actually, we're going to just do an example with trees, and then we'll go to the shrubs. Um, let's remove these two branches with thinning cuts. We're keeping the main stem. We're keeping a bunch of the other branches. What happens is that tree is thinned out. The canopy, the crown of that is opened up. Okay, we might want to do that if we're developing structure in a tree. Uh, again, those shrubs are a little different. But regardless, it's opened up. That's what we're trying to point out here. How about th thinning a shrub? When we're thinning shrubs, the goal is really to maintain the size of the shrub. It's not going to get bigger. We're not knocking it back completely. We want to maintain size. So in this example, we're starting here with this, this shrub. 
it's an interesting shrub. It only comes from the ground, apparently. In this example, we're actually going to remove about a third of uh, the stems all the way to the ground line. Well, I say all the way to the ground, uh, four to six inches. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And we're actually going to use heading cuts on roughly a third of the, the stems or the branches. The goal, <coughs> excuse me, the goal eventually is to maintain the size. And remember, heading, heading cuts are okay on deciduous shrubs. You can cut those in the middle of a branch and it's okay. Why is it okay? And I, it's where I'm trying to engage the audience, but it's hard to do because we're online as well. Uh, why is it okay on shrubs and not trees? The reason is because heading cuts result in sprouts, a lot of sprouts. And actually sometimes reduction cuts will too if they're, if they're too heavy to cut. But heading cuts result in sprouts. And on a tree, those sprouts aren't very strongly attached. And there's a lot of other problems with heading cuts on trees. And on trees, we're worried about those new branches eventually breaking off and falling on us. Not so worried about that in a shrub. Okay, so we can cut back, uh, we can head back shrubs. Okay, and in the end, after we follow this uh, regime, thin out about a third of them, cut back, head about a third of them, we have this thin shrub. And it'll grow back and it'll, but it will maintain the size overall. And uh, this is actually fairly common. Um, now, admittedly, with myself, my own experiences, I usually just let things go. So, but this can be done. Okay, remember those reduction cuts. Reduction cuts, we're cutting the larger branch for the larger stem, and the smaller one should be at least half the size of the bigger one. It's okay on deciduous trees in moderation. What about deciduous shrubs? Well, let's look at that. Okay. Now, in this example, I find it interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little more. Um, it, it's a lot of diagrams. I apologize for that. I don't have great pictures, and uh, we'll so we'll do the best we can. So we're going to start here. Let's use reduction cuts. We're going to leave some of the smaller stems, cut back some of the bigger stems, and when we're done, this is what it looks like. Okay, roughly the shape is round, not perfectly round, not nice and even, but roughly the shape is round. And when it comes back, new growth, that we still have that rounded shape, uh, but it still maintains the, the, the form a little bit, but it also is smaller. The goal in reduction is reduce, make it smaller. We want to try to more or less keep the same shape. Um, now that being said, we're using reduction cuts. Okay, what if we're using heading cuts? Uh, that's what's going to happen then. Well, in that case, start with the same shrub. Heading cuts. Basically, we're we're creating a hedge here. We're cutting at a specific distance, specific location. Whether there's a whether there's a branch union there or not. Okay, there's heading cuts. There's probably actually heading and reduction and thinning because we're actually just shaping the whole thing. And when it's all done, it looks like this. And uh, sometimes with those heading cuts, the sprouts will come back and try to be more leaders. They'll try to grow straight up. So that can cause a little problem sometimes. You would definitely see this in trees. Um, I've often heard people say when they're, when they're topping trees, like this, when they're using heading cuts on trees. Oh, we're just giving the tree a haircut. Well, I'm sorry, trees don't have hair. They have branches and leaves, and those leaves are where they get their energy. That's how they produce energy from the sun. Okay, that's how they produce sugar, and that's how they grow. Um, again, I'm not so much worried about this on, that on a shrub. Okay, yeah, shrubs will grow back, and quite frankly, they got some mechanisms where we can just plain start over. Another technique, it's called renewal. Uh, at least this is our own uh, word for it by predecessor, Esther's predecessor, excuse me, uh, Ron Smith, uh, uses this term renewal, where you're starting off with a shrub and you're removing about a third 
of the stems all the way to the ground. And you let those grow back. Okay. And as they grow back, they're going to develop. You're actually removing the oldest ones. You're removing the really oldest ones. Letting new sprouts come along. Again, you remove about a third. Uh, let those new sprouts come along. And over the course of two to three years, you do this two or three times, and eventually you have a brand new shrub. Okay, this is acceptable. Um, I've never done it quite like this. I've come close, but this is a really easy way to, you know, get that shrub started over again. Similarly, again, this terminology, there's a lot of these that kind of, kind of blend one to the next. Uh, similarly, there's this technique called coppicing. And sometimes we use this in forestry. Um, sometimes it's called rejuvenation. We're making it juvenile again. We're making it young again. Um, I've also heard the term renovation. And in uh, my pruning book by Dr. Ed Gilman, the 300 plus pages, he, he actually says remote. And I think he's trying to, I think it was a typo. I think he meant renovate. It was kind of bizarre. But what's the deal here? Well, basically, okay, this example, you, the background here, you see red osier dogwood. Great shrub, one of my favorites. Um, here's some red osier dogwoods in Bismarck. And these things are about 8 to 10 feet tall. They're really long and leggy. And what the guy did is he cut them down to the ground, 4 to 6 inches. Um, he was in his mid-50s. He needed to work out one winter day, one, fall, one March day. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll renovate those shrubs. I'll rejuvenate them. Good for him. Good for you. Uh, his name's Craig. Oh, no, I shouldn't name names. Sorry. Never, never mind. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he cut them down to the ground. Okay, about four to six inches. Uh, it wasn't exactly, you know, it, it wasn't exactly perfect, but about that high. What happened? By the end of that first summer, they, they were about two thirds of their original height. They just started right over. And let me tell you, dogwoods do great at this. Willows do great at this. Okay, a lot, a lot of deciduous shrubs will do great at this. Now in this example, you can see, it, it must be like July or August because all his grass is brown at this point. But by the end of that first summer, they grew back. Okay, to two thirds of their original height. They're doing fine. Now I do want to point out, okay, they, they had good color. But I do want to point out, this is deciduous shrubs only. This is not, uh, is not conifers. Um, dormant season only. Well, mostly. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, with these, we did this in the dormant season. Right now is a great time. You want a good workout? Go and cut down shrubs. Probably not every year. Okay. Uh, the, the shrub has to rebuild its energy reserves. It has to rebuild its New tissue. It's got to rebuild a stem. It's got to rebuild leaves. It's got to rebuild buds. It has to rebuild that. And that's kind of important. Um, so, in this case, I've, I've heard of as little as three years, coppicing on a three year cycle. Um, I'd say at least five years. Uh, it's, you know, maybe every five years, maybe every eight years, whatever. You can do this quite a bit, actually. Now, that being said, unhealthy or very old plants may not respond. So you got to be a little careful. Um, I, when I did that coppicing and that uh, windbreak at the, the Hort Gardens, there were some shrubs that didn't come back. And I had them planted in a nice, neat row. And uh, generally, where there was a gap, well, the side ones just grew in. They, they outcompeted anything that was going to come back anyway. So it wasn't a big deal. It filled in just fine. Um, but beware that. If the uh, plant is unhealthy or it's really old when you start this, it might not respond. So be careful about that. Okay. Uh, that's uh, controlling uh, size. And I, let's talk about controlling shape very quickly. And what do we mean here? Well, of course, you know, they are hedges, really formal hedges like these. I can't imagine a hedge that tall. <laughs> Can you? I cannot. Uh, Topiary and uh, bonsai, and we're not going to talk about topiary or bonsai. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about hedges. In terms of hedges and controlling shape, you can have a nice formal hedge like this where it's sheared, and very briefly, 
Uh, try to make the bottom wider than the top to get a little sunlight down there. Um, hedges are a little difficult because they're always getting bigger. They're always growing. And controlling that is very difficult in a formal hedge like that. Now, we're, when the new growth comes along, I sorry, I forgot to put this in. When the new growth comes along in the spring and it's about anywhere from 6 to 12 inches tall, when it's still green and tender, that's when you should shear the hedge. Okay, you shear it to about within one to two inches of the old growth. Uh, what I've, uh, the plant we had the hedge with was Ketoniaster, uh, made a nice thick hedge, uh, had some other issues with, with insects, but as far as the hedge goes, generally it did pretty good. And if the hedge gets too big, if it's deciduous, you can always coppice and start over. That's kind of the neat thing about it. Again, try to get the bottom really wide and, uh, and then build it up from there. Uh, or you can try an informal hedge. In an informal hedge, you know, you have the plants planted together nice and close like you would in a regular hedge, in a formal hedge. Uh, but it's, it's less formal. It's informal. It's not square shapes, not geometric shapes. Okay. What happens if you try this? and the plants are all next to each other. Well, this example, uh, we've got a nice tall hedge here. It's getting long. So we try a bunch of reduction cuts. And what happens is it brings that hedge down into something a little more manageable. Um, it's, less, it's not formal. It's a little more, uh, I don't know, informal, civilized. <laughs> well, that's, it's more natural looking, yes. Um, and it's funny, they, they talk about it, one of the advantages of, advantages of an informal hedge is if somebody falls through it or gets broken down, it, it's hard to tell. You know, that happens in a formal hedge. You get a hole in it, you get a gap in it. It's pretty easy to tell. Uh, this is harder to tell. So uh, very quickly, I want to talk about pinching. Uh, pinching in terms of cutting new growth in the spring when that comes out. It, or clipping, you can do, you don't have to pinch, you can actually use clippers. But this is a way to increase density. Again, to say to a shrubs, you're heading into this year's growth, the most recent year's growth. Okay, and that should in the long run make it fuller and thicker. Now that being said, now we're going to talk about some of the finer points. And all of this I was talking about, um, I was talking about this, I mentioned nothing about flowers. Flowers are a big deal to a lot of people on a lot of shrubs, okay? And if you want flowers to come back, well, then timing is important. If you want flowers to come back, you prune just after flowering on all these different ones. Um, I get questions every year, uh, especially on lilacs, you know, that, okay, we want to prune our lilacs. If we prune right now in March, dormant season, uh, will we still get flowers? No, no. The flower buds are on last year's growth. This year's flower buds are on last year's growth. So if you cut off last year's growth, you're going to lose this year's flower buds. So after flowering is done, then you, then you trim, you pinch back, you prune um, before next year's flower buds are even built. And this goes for a lot of different species. Um, I kind of have hydrangea in, with a question mark here. Uh, I don't have experience with pruning that back. Uh, basically, we just have a hard time keeping hydrangeas alive. Uh, you know, they, they die back, at least ours do. And uh, we'll probably post that question out there when we interact a little more. Uh, but these are the, very, the most common ones we'll see around here. Yes, there are even more that we had to worry about outside of North Dakota, more species like this. So just after flowering on all of these. And oh yeah, and then there was, anybody growing barberry as a flowering shrub for the flowers? Uh, I, got, I, got no, I got nothing here in Fargo. Barberry is it's sharp, it's pointy. I've, that's how I know it. It's got some pretty leaves. I've never really seen it flower. Um, I think they said uh, Carragana, Siberian pea shrub. Uh, the flowers, anybody growing that for flowers? Yeah, one, okay, just to be a, yeah, thanks. All right, um, 
you know, mock orange, uh, we got that. Uh, pears and cherries, we got those. Those are beautiful. So prune those after they flower. Uh, very briefly, because we're running out of time here, this is about perfect. Conifers, I'm not going to get into hardly because conifers are tricky because each one of them is, is a little different than the others. And all I have to say right now, maybe we'll do this next year as a, maybe we'll do this next year, uh, for a presentation. Conifers, you can use thinning cuts any time of year. Okay, that's fine. Or most any time of year. Um, we don't use heading cuts on conifers. Uh, pinching conifers is really tricky other than, well, yeah, it's really tricky and I have here don't do. Maybe we'll get into this next year. Um, it's really tricky because of where the buds are. On some species, the buds are all over the branch and it really doesn't matter where when you prune or pinch. Uh, some they form only at the end, so you got to be careful about those. And we'll get into that presentation next year. But that being said, I finished early. You, you said you'd give me a hug. Tom said he'd give me a hug. So, you said you'd give me a hug if I finished early. That's the second talk. Oh, okay. Okay. So that being said, I'll open it up for questions and uh, I'll go to our moderator here. Okay, Joe. How about, how far back can I prune a spirea bush? How far back can you prune a spirea bush? Uh, my question, do I have to repeat the question? No. Nope. Your mic? Yep. Okay. Um, if you want clarification, I'll be happy to. For example, are we talking about a pink flowering spirea or the bridal wreath spirea? I will defer to you, Tom. You guys, I think you might have experience with this. Uh, yes. Okay. If they're talking about uh, bridal wreath spirea, that, those are the ones with those white, gorgeous flowers that mm -hmm. cascade in the springtime. Uh, that forms its buds on the previous year's growth, the flower buds on the previous year's growth. So just like Joe was talking about with lilacs and such, that um, in many cases what we do is we wait until those plants have um, have bloomed and then we go after them. And we will do the rejuvenation type of pruning where we will cut back the old canes right down to the base. The, just a selective pruning, maybe 25% of the Kind of like a case. thinning. A thinning, right, right at the base. Um, if it's a pink flowering spirea bush, they're very common, that blooms on its new wood, and so now is a good time to prune those back about halfway, and then that will keep them compact, and then the, the new flush of growth will give you a nice bloom this year. And then also after the first flush of blooms, you can uh, trim off those wasted pink flowers and sometimes you get a second flush of blooms. So make sure you know your spirea. The pink flower ones are more common today. Cut them back halfway now and uh, you'll be delighted this summer. Of course, the first question is, uh, is one of the trick questions. Yeah, spireas are tricky, it depends. So. Okay, Joe, how about the, those lilacs? Again, you did a, a good job di discussing about lilacs in general, but how about something particular like, should I clip off the seed pods of uh, the lilac blossom? You can, you don't have to. Uh, seed pods are the previous flowers, okay? At that point, uh, they are taking energy from the plant. Uh, some people don't like how they look. I mean, they're, some people do like how they look. They add a little bit of interest. Uh, so it really could go either way with those. How about you mentioned dogwood? Is now a good time to prune variegated dogwood? Yes, it is. Uh, this my experience is yes, it is. That being said, the variegated dogwoods, uh, I assume most commonly ivory halo dogwood around here. Uh, it's it's a beautiful shrub. I've seen some really nice ones. I've also seen some really lousy ones. Um, I think it's very site dependent on how how well it grows, okay? Um, if it's, again, as I, as I pointed out, with that coppicing, uh, be careful in terms of if it's unhealthy or really, really old, it might not respond. So uh, it's going to depend on the individual plant. Okay, back to lilacs. Uh, there's a very large lilac in their backyard. 
should they prune that after flowering, and if so, should they cut it, cut it all the way down? You know, um, after, no, don't cut it all the way down after flowering. Um, it's a little tricky here. If you want to prune and just prune and shape and thin out, um, you can do that after flowering, and you'll still get flowers next year. If you want to rejuvenate the whole thing, you would do that now. You'd cut it down to the ground now, but that being said, you won't get flowers this year, okay? Because the plant has to put its energy into new growth. I don't recommend uh, cutting it down to the ground, you know, after that first flush of new growth because it spends a lot of energy putting out new growth, new branches, new leaves. And if we then cut it all down to the ground, it's got to put out a second flush. And that's a real hit on the energy reserves of a plant. Okay, we, you know, they store energy for the winter, and uh, yeah, they can take a little bit of, of hit after uh, the leaves come out. You know, I think about this in terms of insects. Okay, defoliating insects. The leaves are coming out, the defoliating insects come in, they chew off all the leaves. Is that hard on a tree? Yeah, because it has to put out a second flush of leaves. Can it do it? Well, generally, yeah. Usually it can. Usually there's enough food reserves for it to start again. Uh, but do that two or three times is tough. So, that's uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going on a little too more than... No, it's good, much. Joe. It's really good. Um, lots of good questions coming from the people and keep coming. This person has a Colorado spruce and the center branch appears to be dead. I guess mm -hmm. we call it the trunk or the top of the trunk. The leader. The leader. The rest of the tree looks great. Mm -hmm. Should they snip off the leader? If the leader is dead, yes. What you can then do is take one of the side branches near the top, you can bend it upwards and splint it in place such that it will become the new leader. Um, you can do nothing, you can do nothing and that will likely happen on its own, uh, or you can tip it up and um, help it along its way. It's a little tough to do sometimes, but you can do that. Okay, lots of lilac questions here. How about, um, how many years after you cut a lilac to the ground can you expect flowers again? I don't know. That's a good question. I would expect them in the second year if there's enough energy reserves. Depends on growth. At least with trees, uh, we talk about, well, we talk about trees have to be a certain, a certain size before they flower. It's not an age thing. It's actually a size thing. With shrubs, um, it, it's kind of similar. And in terms of new growth, the tree, the shrub, the lilac, has to rebuild new growth uh, above ground, and that takes energy. It's still got an established root system, though, and that's a good thing. It doesn't have to establish roots and a top. It just has to establish a new top. So I would expect pretty quick, two to three years. How about my poor lilac hasn't bloomed for years? What can I do, Joe? Will rejuvenation pruning help? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. My, my guess, though, is that it's over top and not getting enough sun. That's probably what's going on. So uh, look at the environment, and if you can get it more sunlight, that's probably what's going on. It's a very common problem. All right, make sure it's a lilac. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tree that's 35 years old that overhangs my deck, and I've been cutting the branches so it is a semicircle, so the birds cannot sit right above the deck. Okay. Is that okay? Can I keep doing that? Shaping is fine. I recommend those thinning cuts. Um, you can use reduction cuts. Uh, you can shape a tree. That's fine. Uh, with trees. I do want to say, generally we recommend don't take off more than about one quarter of the branches or leaves in any one year, uh, because more than that, it really starts to stress the tree a lot. Um, yeah, if you take off more than that, can the tree survive? Sure. It's just that it starts getting a little more stressed, a little more stressed, the more you go above that 25%. We used to say, we used to say 33%. And well, that was a little too much, and the recommendation now is back down to about 25. 
Okay, back to spring flowering shrubs. How long can we leave flowers before we prune them so we can enjoy the flowers? I'd say leave them on as long as you uh, can. Uh, generally, blooms in North Dakota, oh boy, it depends on the species. Anybody ever get more than about two weeks out of a shrub? Yeah, it depends on the weather, especially yeah. the wind. That's right. Um, so I'd say let it go through its flowering time and then take them off. Yeah. You know, and is, is it is it possible just to selectively prune your lilac to take out a few of the the teens at the base in the March for April? For sure, April? absolutely. It's certainly possible. Uh, what I've often seen with lilacs are a few really big stems and a lot of little suckers coming up, a lot of thin suckers coming up. Yeah, you could thin back those larger stems, take out about a third of those, and let those young ones develop. And if you took out a third of the bigger ones, well, you're still going to have some nice uh, flowers and a nice shrub overall. Um, one thing we really didn't talk about is the, the shape of plants and what you envision this is going to be. And, and try to look with the artist's eye, as I like to say. Try to look with the artist's eye to see what's this going to look like if I cut here? What is going to be lost? Where is it going to come back and fill in? Okay, it's just kind of hard to do. It's a little tricky. It takes a little practice. Um, you know, my wife is an artist, so she's taught me a lot of these things. Well, how about, uh, Joe, how can I stop my apple tree from getting too tall? How can you stop your apple tree? I don't want to head it back. Tall? You don't want to head it back. Um, you can use those reduction cuts, and reduction is different from heading. Okay, you are removing a central leader, and you're developing a more open form. Um, Tom, do you... Do you have a presentation on apple tree pruning, fruit tree pruning? Uh, uh, not, tr not at I'm this year's not forum. Not tonight, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this. It, it's a little tricky because if you want to, you know, it, it's as tricky as you want it to be. Um, but you can use that reduction cut on the main leader, and then you just grow a more open form. Um, I think that's a good way to that's a good way to put it. I would say the only way to do that without heading back is to uh, make the single cut method, which is what I call a chainsaw at the trunk, and cut it all down and replant a semi dwarf tree in place. <laughs> that's one way to do that's it. That's the only way I know how to do it without heading it back. Otherwise, I like your idea. If you got a big old tree, to head it back, like you say, you got to head it. You got to head it back. Well, so do central leaders over. Or you got to cut out the main trunk. Yes. And now instead of a central leader Christmas tree, it's going to be more like an open umbrella tree, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of old orchards. Like I'm from, that's the way we prune our yeah. trees. The whole key for good apple production is get lots of light in the canopy, and there's no sin cutting down the tree so it's manageable. And it is tough because trees want to grow up, even you know, right. even those dwarf ones do. It's just that it's, there's limits on it. It is tough. Thank you. Uh, we've got a, a dogo crab apple right now that I'm trying to develop good structure on, and it's got that big central leader. It's growing really great. And it's going to overgrow the house if I don't uh, control that. So, sorry, back to you, Tom. Okay, Joe, we got a very destructive question here. They want to. What's the best way to kill a shrub that you don't want? <laughs> Is pruning the best way? Um, cut it down to the ground, coppice. Actually, wait a couple more weeks till it's just starting to flush out. Cut it down to the ground and spray it with herbicide, glyphosate, Roundup should do a pretty good job of that. Okay, there you go. Kill the shrub. No more pruning needed. <laughs> How, about, do it. <laughs> How about, let's talk dogwoods. They have some old growth that's dying or dead. Mm -hmm. How do We want to keep them looking good. Do we cut out the dead material? Yes, absolutely. Come on. <laughs> you, can, you can cut out dead material almost any time of year, and I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's just a, a haven for diseases. Is there ever a time when pruning sealer should be used? 
I will, I will give the easy answer and say mostly no. Well, the easy answer is no. Okay. Uh, the, the harder answer is mostly no. There are certain diseases that we don't have here in North Dakota where it can help prevent disease from getting in, but we don't have those in North Dakota, so. So no. don't use a pruning sealer. Nope. You're wasting your money. Um, any other last question? Okay, what does it take to get virgin pear trees to bloom more? Okay, I don't know. We're kind of getting off pruning here. I, yeah, do you, <laughs> I, virgin pear trees? I like, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> I'm not pears. familiar with that term. <laughs> um, like, I, like I said. Must be young pears. Yes, okay. Like How about be patient? Yeah, uh, trees have to be big enough to flower. Sure. It's not an age thing, it's a size thing. And if they haven't been there long enough, um, they're not big enough, they're not going to flower. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you get questions every year about honey crisp apple, which uh, takes a long time, up here anyway, for it to get big enough or, or before it flowers. People say, oh, I've had this in the ground for years. doesn't flower. Well, it takes time. That's notoriously slow to reach size. Yeah, and I like your idea also, Joe, about make sure it's getting full sun. That makes yes. a big difference. Um, was it time? Are we going to turn this over to Esther? Joe, there's so much good stuff here. Uh, how about, uh, how about, uh, this is, do you want to talk about honeyberry plants? I know okay. almost nothing about honeyberry. Okay, so same, th same with me and everybody else here. So. If you want to know about honeyberry plants, I strongly recommend you ca contact Kathy Wiederholt um, at Carrington. And also you can uh, download Kathy's talk from last week. She talks about pruning and how it's still a mystery for us on honeyberries. We don't know mm -hmm. how to do it, but the University of Saskatchewan does have a grower's guide for honeyberries. They call those plants half caps up there, so you can Google that, yeah. a half gap pr production guide from University of Saskatchewan. Likewise, there's a question about raspberries. Um, I recommend that we, that's kind of a detailed answer. I recommend the University of Wisconsin has outstanding fruit growing publications for gardeners. I recommend you Google growing raspberries in Wisconsin. You'll love the drawings and all the information you need for that. Uh, one last question here. How about like for an evergreen tree? Some should we cut off the branches near the bottom of the tree to allow for clearance of mowing and such? If you want to, yes. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's not going to hurt the tree. Uh, some people hate it. They say it reduces the uh, the structure of the tree. Not the structure. It reduces the visual quality of the tree. They want to see a nice cone going all the way to the ground. Uh, some people uh, don't. Some people want to see actually that main stem and that cone above it. Uh, it's certainly not going to hurt the tree and whoever's running the mower is probably going to be grateful. Okay, uh, that's it for this session. Okay. Let's all thank Joe for a wonderful talk. <laughs>